Well, good morning, church family. We're so glad that you've joined us this day, and uh, I invite you, wherever you are, home or away, just let's join our hearts together as one church family, lifting up our hearts to the Lord right now to praise Him, to worship Him, to just come before His wonderful throne of grace. Lord, we love you. We love you because of all that you are, how great and beautiful, vibrant and alive you are, Lord. And because you loved us first, you are the one who reached down to us and lifted us up out of the miry clay, set our feet upon solid rock, made our footsteps firm, and placed a new song in our hearts. So we sing to you, we worship you today. In your powerful, mighty name, we seek and ask and pray. Amen. He created everything and he owns it all. It's all his. Let's worship him, our King of Kings. You set the boundaries for the ocean.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me. In the secret place, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock, and my head will be lifted up, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Lord, you are a God for all seasons. Lord, it's our privilege to be able to, to praise and exalt you. Or as we just sang, may we recognize that, Lord, you're always with us. You're always there. You're always reliable. Lord, I pray that when our hearts are troubled or challenged, that we will just have the good sense and wisdom to turn to you. Lord, it's in your arms, it's in your presence that it's the only place life really makes sense. It's there, Lord, that you remind us that we have a future and a hope because of you. And Lord, I just praise you and thank you for how great and good you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this morning at 11 o'clock, we have the, the typical ministries going on, uh, youth and children's and Sunday school. Also, we just kicked off a uh, new midweek Bible study this week. Bible Project is working their way through the Bible this year. We looked at first 11 chapters of Genesis, and it was really good, and I encourage you to join us and be a part of it. Also, a reminder that this month's leadership offering is uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. They do incredible work supporting uh, persecuted Christians and churches throughout the world, and uh, it's a privilege to partner with them. And uh, they're also sort of the sister of, uh, what am I thinking of, Doug? It's not Voice of the Martyrs, it's uh, Spirit of Martyrdom, and also Russell is connected with those guys, so it's a great ministry. So with that, let's just turn our hearts to the Lord again in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for your word. And Lord, some of these things that we're going to look at, we pass over so quickly. Lord, I know for myself, I've, I've missed so many things in not taking time to ponder and consider your suffering and all that you did. And so, Lord, I pray that you would move in our hearts today, that you would speak to us, that you would just enable us to see all that you've done and why in a, in a new and a deeper way today. And I praise you in advance for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> This morning we're going to continue our study of Jesus' last evening on earth by examining a section of scripture that, at least personally, I find to be both difficult and challenging. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but you know, it's sort of in a nutshell, the reason it's difficult for me is just seeing Jesus suffer and be put through the things that he was put through. And I, I think you'll learn some new important things this morning. So why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We'll pick it up in verse 57. Matthew 26, 57. It says, Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. So what we have here is that the temple guards who, you know, with, after Jesus has been pointed out by Judas, arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They took him to Jerusalem to face Caiaphas, the high priest, and the rest of the Sanhedrin. You know, this is the, really the ruling party, the, the leaders of Israel. Now, it's interesting because John's gospel provides us with a little additional information. He tells us that they didn't go immediately to Caiaphas' house. First, they took Jesus to Annas' house, who he was, it's interesting, he was actually Caiaphas' father-in-law, and he'd been the high priest for a long time, but Rome had removed him. We talked about what they were doing a few, few weeks ago. But many in Israel still saw him as being the true high priest. So he interrogated Jesus, Matthew admits that, and then sent him on to Caiaphas. And we see that, you know, they assembled in the middle of the night in the home of the high priest. Now, you need to understand, this was not their normal meeting place. You know, they were meeting illegally, 
plotting a murder without a fair trial and doing it during a special feast, and all of these things went against the Pharisaical law code. Now, before we examine our text more closely, I, wanna, I just want to sort of front load some very, very important information, things I think we really need to understand if we're going to really get the maximum out of what takes place here. Because as I, as I prayed a few minutes ago, it's, it's so easy for us to just sort of speed through this and not really understand what's what. And so let me point out and start by saying you've got to know and understand that the religious leaders were not interested in the truth or in justice or in giving Jesus a fair trial. In their minds, he had to die. And their blind obsession led them to pervert the very justice they had been appointed to protect. You know, they were God's spokespeople. They were the ones that were intended to carry out his word and his truth. You know, and, and they're perverting that whole thing. And, and this is the same group of individuals that we ran into back in ch- ch- or verses 3 and 4. Now, what I want to do before we dive in is I want to review the actions taken by the religious leaders that were illegal according to their own law. So based on Sanhedrin law, but also on Scripture, I'm going to list for you at least most of the things that they did that went against God's word and against their own code of law. First of all, even before the trial began, they had predetermined that Jesus must die. You'll see that in John chapter 11, verse 50, Mark 14, 1. So there's no innocent till proven guilty here. Second, according to the Mishnah, which sort of, it it kind of lists all the rules and regulations. It's sort of the, the governing documents. According to the Mishnah, no trials were to occur at night, and they were to be public, not secret, and they were to be held in the hall of judgment in the temple, not in the high priest's home. Third, capital offenses required a quorum of 23 judges, And they were supposed to follow a strict order of arguments from both the defense and the prosecution. Fourth, like our justice system in the United States, accused persons were to have an advocate to speak on their behalf. Today we have attorneys. They They had legal representation, someone that could question any witnesses that were brought forward, encounter their testimony, and they were intended to be able to bring forth witnesses on behalf of the one on trial. Now, the interesting thing is, a person, at least in a capital offense, could not be forced to testify against themselves. Not supposed to be done, but as we're going to see, the high priest is going to completely disregard that in Jesus' false trial. Fifth, conviction required the agreement of two or three witnesses who could be cross-examined individually, not as a group, which we'll see, and contradictory testimonies were to be thrown out. Now, by the way, normally, the religious leaders went through an elaborate system of screening witnesses to ensure that justice was done. You know, you read through Scripture. Right now, I'm, I'm in the middle of Leviticus, so I'm seeing all these things that are laid out. God really cares about justice and things being done rightly. And as we saw last week, he will hold those accountable who pervert justice. He's, they're going to have to deal with him at some point. So they, at the heart of that, and God talked about that a lot also in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. You couldn't just come up and make a testimony against somebody or you know, do things to them without due process. Those witnesses had to be screened and checked so it wasn't that they were just ticked off at somebody or they had their own agenda or they were mad. They had to be righteous in those things. But as you're going to see in verse 59, the religious leaders were actually looking and searching for false witnesses that they could bring in to testify against Jesus. So again, a complete perversion of justice and truth. Sixth, and you're going to see this one come into play today too. When a trial was over, members of the Sanhedrin were to adjourn for a lengthy, lengthy discussion to consider all the evidence, and then voting for or against conviction was supposed to be done in a very orderly fashion, 
and kind of the way the Jews operated it, it began with the youngest members of the council to the oldest. But as we're going to see in our text, you will see that none of these procedures was followed at all. Total false mock trial. Now you also need to understand that the religious, at this point, the religious leaders thought they finally had Jesus where they wanted him. And they were, they were determined to accomplish their wicked plans as quickly and quietly as possible. They want to get this done. Justice didn't matter. Now, while all this was happening with Jesus, according to verse 58, Peter was attempting to redeem himself and keep the promises he had made to stand by Jesus even unto the death. So he was following at a distance, committed enough to trespass on the high priest's property, but not wanting to be discovered. We're going to dig into that really deep next week. Now, to Peter's credit, he risked coming into the high priest's courtyard, which was a, it's actually a pretty large, unroofed open space surrounded by the various buildings and lots of gates and fences. And he sat down with the guards who served the Sanhedrin and pretended that he belonged there. You know, I think he wanted to see what was going to happen to Jesus. You know, what were they going to do to him? I also believe that he wanted Jesus to notice him, to, to know that he was there. Now, look, he may have even been waiting and hoping for Jesus to exert himself in a, a miraculous demonstration of his power, you know, to just do something to extricate himself from all these things. Now, look at verse 59. Now, the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so, they might, so that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? So... We see that the key leaders under the high priest and the Sanhedrin were running the show. And with, with Caiaphas supervising and stepping in at crucial, crucial points, and together they were looking for false testimony against Jesus. Now again, this was a violation of the ninth commandment that said you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You find that in Exodus 20.16 and also in Deuteronomy. Now another couple things I need to point out. I want you to see this. Matthew used what's known as the Greek, the, in Greek, the imperfect tense of the words that are translated kept trying. That's important because what it communicates to us, the idea is that they kept trying to bring false witnesses forward to testify against Jesus. But they didn't find any testimony that they could make stick. Now let me also point out that the words but later in verse 60 implied that they had tried to do this for quite some time. But the thing is, Jesus had broken no laws. He hadn't done anything wrong. And then finally, they began to have some degree of success when two witnesses came forward and said that Jesus had made a statement that could be misconstrued as blasphemy against the temple. They quoted Jesus as saying, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. But Jesus never actually said those words. He said something close, but he was talking about his own body that, you know, when it was destroyed. And he was talking about his death on the cross. And in the three days was a reference to the resurrection. So they completely twisted that. And, and the interesting thing is that, same, that accusation would be used again as they watched Jesus die on the cross and that same exact accusation would be used years later against Stephen before they stoned him to death. So these false witnesses attempted to convict Jesus of a capital crime worthy of a death sentence. The thing is, is that if, just, if justice was done, these false witnesses should, you know, and these false witnesses were shown to be liars, which they were, both of them, according to Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 21, should have received the death penalty. 
However, these two guys felt safe. Why? Because the men with the authority to convict them of giving false testimony were the ones who had incited them and encouraged them to give false testimony. So again, another just a complete sham. And, and, if, and again, if you look at this just in the flesh, this is horrible. But I want to step back for a moment. And, I, and what I'm going to tell you, this is, this is of great importance. Whatever the official status of this meeting, all of the gospel writers are very clear that it was not un, an unprejudiced hearing. It was convened specifically so they could put Jesus to death. But here's what's important. But Matthew wants us to see in this unfolding of these things more than a sordid maneuver by the priests. He wants us to see that this was the moment, this was the time when Jesus chose to climactically declare before the supreme authorities of Israel his messianic mission and why he was there. See, that's so we could get caught up in all these terrible guys, and it's bad, and it is. But Matthew wants us to see that they're behind this. God's in control, and this was the moment that Jesus, because he's got the key religious leaders for the whole nation right there in front of him. And at that point, he reveals the ultimate truth. So it's interesting. This seemingly helpless victim of official suppression as we start to move forward from here, will progressively be revealed as the builder of the new temple, the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one now to be enthroned as Lord at God's right hand. So there is a rich irony. Again, if you just kind of blast through it or get bummed out and keep going, you'll miss this. There is a rich, a rich irony underlies this entire scene. And what, pe what, what we are intended to see is that it is these judges who ultimately are going to be judged. Now look at verse 63. But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you were the Christ, the Son of God. Shouldn't have done that. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Now, despite the, the false testimony, we see that initially Jesus remained silent. He did that in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. And just as no sign would change the hardened hearts of the hypocrites that we look back in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 45, and later in Matthew 16, 1 through 4, so too no answer was going to change. It didn't matter what he said. It was not going to change their opinion of him. I also want you to see that by remaining silent, you can see the brilliance of our Lord, Jesus allowed them to convict themselves by their persistent efforts to find some shred of evidence against him. And when all their attempts failed, again, you might miss this, Caiaphas took the lead saying, you know, I adjure you by the living God. Now, Jews know this, you and I may not. This was the that was his trump card. Since according to Jewish law, the, the high priest had the authority to force a person to testify. Now, as I told earlier, not in, a, not in a capital case, but that didn't stop him. So part of one of the little side things here is that if Jesus remained silent, he would have violated the law. So his decision answer, to answer showed respect for civil law and authority. But, but that's sort of a side note. The really important thing is this. Again, I want you to see this. His answer shows that the time was right in his sovereign plan to speak and move one step closer to the, his death on the cross. And look at the question he was instructed to answer. Tell us whether you were the Christ, the Son of God. But keep in mind, Jesus had answered that question many times for all who were willing to hear. And not only had he answered it, he backed up his claim with authoritative words and miracles. We, remember how we read this. No man ever taught like this before. They'd never seen anybody expound scripture like that. But he had done literally hundreds of miracles and exorcisms and things that all proved that he was 
the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. But given the stubborn refusal of the Sanhedrin to accept him as Messiah, his admission to being the Messiah would have been seen as blasphemy. So here's kind of the, one of the most important things I want you to see today. From God's perspective, we'll, we'll talk about it from the human one in a minute. The time was right. The question was right. It was the heart of the one asking the question that was wrong. So Jesus spoke, and his answer was yes, but he added wording that made the high priest's own words the answer to the question he asked. You've said it yourself. And then Jesus turned to address the entire Sanhedrin, and he said, this is verse, the second part of verse 64. Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Powerful stuff. When he said hereafter, what he's saying is, in the future. In other words, in the coming days, when he would be the judge, all of them would be standing trial before him. Now, again, let's go back to 64, where he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, here he is quoting, really, there's lots of messianic you know, prophecies and sections in Scripture. But this is sort of the, the key one, the big one. He's quoting the, the, this key passage, Son of Man, from Daniel 7.13. This is kind of the, the ultimate messianic text. And Jesus used it here to affirm with authority, both in the boldness with which he was speaking to them and with the authority of scriptures to back up and support his claim. He's using this as proof that he is exactly the Son of God. He is the Messiah. Now look at verse 65. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, He is blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, He deserves death. Now, you've got to understand from their perspective, this affirmation is exactly what they'd been looking for. It's what they'd been trying to get to. So the high priest tore his clothes as a sign of revulsion and moral indignation at what he saw as blasphemy. Now, we've talked about this before, but let me just remind you that for the Jews, you know, blasphemy was really considered the worst of all possible sins. And, of course, they saw it as being worthy of death. But see, Jesus had not blasphemed. You know, another sad irony here is that he spoke the truth. And he was going to be sentenced to death for telling it. And as far as the Sanhedrin was concerned, there, you know, there were no more need for witnesses since all of them had witnessed and heard Jesus commit what they considered to be the crime of blasphemy. So, again, breaking the protocols I shared with you at the beginning, Caiaphas asked, you know, what do you think? And they immediately answered, he deserves death. Why? Because in their minds, and, and the other gospel writers make, actually say this, because he made himself out to be God. And with that, as far as the religious leaders were concerned, Jesus' death sentence was a done deal. Now look at verse 67. And then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Another detail you need to understand. The job was not yet finished. Now the religious leaders had to convince the Roman authorities that Jesus deserved death under Roman law. Because you see, at this time, the Jews did not have the authority and power to put someone to death. Plus, from uh, the standpoint of Roman law, blasph blasphemy was not a crime deserving death. So they were going to have to manipulate the charges and make Jesus appear as a messianic pretender who was dangerous to Rome as an insurrectionist who was, you know, the idea would be, you know, he's gathering followers together to lead an uprising against the Roman government. 
And with what they perceived as the height of blasphemy, the Sanhedrin officials spit in Jesus' face and they struck him with their fists and they slapped him and mocked him, you know, they're trying to humiliate him. Now, by the way, spitting on him showed their disdain for his claim to be God, striking him. They, by striking him in this manner, they wanted to, to remind him of just how powerless he was. And they slapped him and mocked him for not knowing who was, a, you know, to hit him. One of the details we're going to talk about in a minute that Matthew didn't include, but the other gospel writers did, is they blindfolded him before they hit him. And so this was an attempt to prove that he didn't have the prophetic gift of knowing the future. And although Jesus was innocent from start to finish, never once proven guilty of anything punishable, the rush to judgment could not be stopped. You've got to understand, there's really three factors at work here. These hypocrites. But I, I want you to see this. Diabolical forces greater than power-hungry priests and a corrupt Sanhedrin were at work behind the scenes. This is Satan's work. Although we know that God is, going, is working as well and he's going to trump that. So... You know, what else can we learn? What is it we need to take away from our text this morning? Well, you know, again, I, I've never really gone this deep on, on this part of Scripture. I've kind of just read through it. I've never taught through it. And, and this section of Scripture, if you've been reading ahead, and I hope you are, I really want to encourage you to read this section about Peter next week. This is not one of our typical Sunday morning messages where, you know, there's three nice little neat principles and a conclusion. It doesn't present that way. And so I really only saw one sort of principle, and you may not even think it's a principle. Uh, it may seem kind of weird to you, and maybe it is. Uh, but the thing that stood out to me here, the, the, the lesson I gleaned from it was this. Sometimes loyal obedience to God involves silence. And sometimes loyal obedience to God involves speaking the truth. You know, a lot of times I think, I told you last week, one of the lessons I've been learning is not to defend myself, to not get upset or try to justify, because it seems like most of the time when we blow it, we want to, before we admit it, we want to explain why all these, you know, factors caused us to do it, rather than just saying I screwed up. But there are times when, you know, being loyal and obedient to God, he doesn't want us to say anything. There's other times when we need to take a stand, no matter what people may say or do, for God and his truth. Now, look what we've seen. Initially, Jesus remained silent. He had nothing to say to this group of liars and schemers who had spoken against him. So he chose not to answer their false accusation. But, and this is really important, you need to understand that was a beautiful affirmation of prophecy because more than a thousand almost a thousand years earlier God as he described these events and when you read through the servant songs and other passages we talked about last week you see these things it's not like you have to kind of make it fit it's exact and so first of all his being silent was in fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah 53 7 which says Speaking of our Messiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now, as we saw a few minutes ago, because, you know, they're trying to bay Jesus, and they, you know, because everybody defends themselves. Even we're going to see that in Pilate. Aren't you going to say anything? Because he wouldn't say anything and fall into their trap, the, the, this false trial sort of ground to a halt. But, because silence was the appropriate at that point. But sometimes words are vital in advancing God's kingdom. There's a time when we do need to take a stand. Where there's a time when we do need to speak. And our Lord determined a few minutes later that now's the time to tell them who he really was. And actually he's telling them what's going to happen to them in the future. So again, there is going to be times when, you know, it may not be easy, especially in the way the, the cancel culture is going right now. And, 
you know, they, people at least want us, at the very least, to believe that nobody likes Christians. I think it's false. I think it's a false narrative, but more about that another time, maybe. There's times when, you know, we just, if, if that's how the Spirit is prompting us, we need to take a stand. We need to speak His truth. But again, there are other times when God wants us to be silent because no words are going to help. I've learned that in evangelism over the years. I used to just sort of come in and just put everybody on full blast. And now it's just like, Lord, when you want me to speak, I'll speak. If you don't want to speak or try to, sometimes people say things against the Lord and I start getting feisty and I'm like, no, okay, Lord, you, you want me to zip it? I'm not going there. But sometimes the better testimony and what God's calling for is silence. It, read church history. You will see martyr after martyr there, Confess, you know, renounce Christ, and they're just silent. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of my heroes of the past, a Nazi pastor in Nazi Germany, he, he got out of Germany but felt God wanted him to go back, and he got arrested for not siding with the Nazis and continued to preach the tooth, truth, and they got him in a you know, mock trial and made all these accusations, and he wouldn't say a word. Same, true, same thing is true for many of the, the victims of the Holocaust in the concentration camps. They would not utter a word. And I believe that's a God's lead. See, when God is telling us to be silent, that silence speaks loudly about our confidence in God. You know, it's it's it, you know, in effect, what we're putting out there is that you know, I I trust God, I know God. He is a God of justice and righteousness and mercy. Mercy, and it also tells those attacking us that we aren't afraid or intimidated by what they say or do. Because we know that we stand by a much higher and stronger power than them. You have a classic example of that in Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, builds this 90-foot statue of himself and wants everybody to worship it. And, you know, there's, there's some scheming going on by jealous people on the other side. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, he gives them a chance. He's like, no, no, we're, we're not doing that. Our God can deliver us, but hey, if he doesn't, that's up to him. But we're not, no. Nah. Huh. So I know this is sort of a whimsical and maybe silly thing to some of you. I hope not. But you know what I see here is that sometimes loyal obedience to God involves being silent. Other times it involves taking a stand and speaking the truth in clarity and conviction. Now, to be real honest with you, and I, when I, I always say when people say, now I want to be honest with you. It's like, in Florida, and I'm not normally honest with you, but I want, to be, I want to go deeper with you. I want to share something from my heart. Just being completely transparent, I have always struggled with what is recorded in these verses, as well as what, the, what we're going to see the Roman soldiers do to Jesus. You know, to... And because I've been in Israel, I had some of those thorns. And, you know, these aren't the little tiny things we find out in the woods every now and then. They're about this long and they pierce right through. The thorn of crowns they forced on his head, putting a, a purple robe on him and then getting a, a reed like a false staff and just beating him senseless. I, I know I have friends, I'm looking at one of them right now that likes watching certain movies and seeing this. I can't do it. I don't think I'm a wimp, but I've, I've found something that's longer. Even when we roll around to Easter and we've been actually meeting together, I can't watch the videos. I can barely read. It takes all I have to read about these things. It's just too real to me. It's too wretched and horrible to me. It sickens me. So I've never watched The Passion or most of these Jesus films. I just... I just can't take it. Again, it's hard for me to even read it. You know, and what we have here, to see members of the Sanhedrin, understand these are people appointed by God. Some of this is going to sound a little real and true, but I want you to know I did this message two weeks ago, not this week. To see people appointed to administer justice and righteousness and truth to completely shirk that because of their own personal agendas and grudges. 
to see these religious leaders act in such a despicable way, to see that when all their manipulations of the false witnesses, the lack of evidence, and their attempts to force Jesus to incriminate himself failed, they simply resorted to brutality and violence. It's sickening. Shouldn't happen to any human being. It certainly shouldn't happen to the Son of God. Now, I'm going to go a little deeper on a couple things here. To sit in this culture, to spit in someone's face was the worst insult possible. But these men weren't content to, content to stop there. Because as I mentioned, if you read some of the other Gospels' accounts of this, you are going to find they're, they're gutless. So they put a blindfold over him. And then they took turns hitting him and beating him and then saying, hey, tell us who hit you. Now, the interesting thing is some scholars believe that this was a traditional attest that they applied to anyone that claimed to be the Messiah. If someone said they were the Messiah, this is what they would do. Now, they based that on Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 through 4, because especially in verse 3, it, you get the idea that the Messiah can see things you know, without vision. But at this point, Jesus remained silent, refusing to play their game because he knew that to speak or defend himself was pointless. He'd already been sentenced, though not formally, to die, so he refused to submit to their cruel charade. Now, what's so amazing and encouraging me to me this is going to be one of the principles for next week coming up, is that all of this had been prophesied in Scripture. You know, you want to talk about God's reliability and truth. Again, in Isaiah, only this time, chapter 52, verse 14. Just as many were astonished at you, he's talking about the servant, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Because by the time they were done with Jesus, what we are told is you couldn't even recognize his face anymore. That's how much they would beat him. And the thing that hit me was just, my friends, may we never forget or minimize all that Jesus suffered. The tremendous pain, the humiliation, the reality. You want to talk about patience and self-control. We saw this last week. One word, they're gone. But he endured all of that in order to take our place so that our sin could be removed and so that it would be possible for you and I to get right with God. Sometimes I think we pass through these things quickly and I understand some of the motivation and we, you know, we don't really let it sink in that God was beaten and tortured and all these things happened to him and he endured that for us. And I think, every time I look at this, it's just, what incredible love, what, what, what amazing sacrifice. Look what God has done. And that's why I've been saying to you the last couple months, the thing that just keeps hitting me is that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, these things need to be at the forefront of our mind, that this is not a little forget-me-not and ritual, but we are celebrating the fact that Christ suffered and died. You know, as I said, this wasn't one of those passages where, you know, next week when we look at Peter and the connection to us, there's lots of stuff. But this wasn't one of those that had these neat little principles. But I was really thinking about these events this week and just looking at them. And plus, it's been a week where in the last maybe week or so, I've had a lot of you call me and reach out to me discouraged, concerned by current events. And it was like the Lord just opened my mind to see some things. And, it, and I wanted to share that part of it with you. So I was looking at this and sort of exegeting our culture. I was reminded that throughout these sordid events, our Lord was always in control. No matter what they did or said, there was never a moment when he was not sovereign when he was not actually the one calling 
the shots. And, and that's why I've been bringing in a lot of these scriptures. You need to see, you need to understand, because it affirms just how reliable God's word really is, that all of these horrible, wretched things that they chose to do had been prophesied and predicted by the Lord. In some cases, thousands of years before. But here's the thing I think that connected for me to this, and I hope it'll connect for you. As far as Jesus' friends and disciples were concerned, this was the worst thing that ever happened. No matter how many times he told them, they just didn't understand. Remember, I shared a principle with you last week about, at least, at least for myself, where I have this, I look at things and think, well, God is going to have to do this, this, or that, and usually I'm wrong. And I just think, from, from, as we're going to see next week, from Peter's perspective, but also from the other disciples, this looks horrible. If you're a follower of Jesus, oh my gosh, the world has just ended. Oh, everything is horrible. It's, it, it cannot be worse than this. But see, here's what I want you to see. God knew exactly what he was doing. And he would use these vile and wicked actions by men to accomplish, to accomplish something far, you know, to accomplish something incredible and far greater than our little human hearts and minds can comprehend even now, even when we know how it ends. See, this thing, we see so dimly, even when we read it, even when we study it, and we know a lot of these things, we have more knowledge, obviously, than we do post-resurrection, right? But I want you to see it from their perspective, the world had ended. It's done. All their hopes and dreams dashed. But it wasn't. God was working his sovereign plan exactly as he'd always intended, step by step by step by step. He was saving the world. And there was no other way. And I just hope that that's an encouragement to you is whether you're dealing with you know, frustration over COVID or some other thing, our God's in control. He's not missing a thing. He's, you know, we're not victims. Oh my gosh, the worst is yet to come now. Oh my God. Every day we're just one step closer to seeing him. And so we don't have a, we don't need to be discouraged or afraid no matter how we might think things are. Because you know what? I believe with all my heart, God is working right now in this world. I think God's up to some things that are really exciting. But as I said a moment ago, this part of scripture and what follows always gets to me. Like I said, maybe I'm just a wimp, but it's, the, the more I've come to love the Lord, the, the less I can, I, can I, just, I just can't handle it. And maybe that's true for some of you. Maybe some of you, you just, it's, it's just more than you can think of to, to read and hear what they're doing to the one that we love so much. And, uh, and so I want to close by sharing something with you that God so providentially, I started one of the new devotionals I'm using this year is a book by Beth Moore, and it's, it's blowing my mind. And just so happened this week that she was writing about these same events and it encouraged me so much, and it helped me approach Jesus' suffering death with a, with a better perspective. I'm not going to say it's new because I've been around this long enough that I should know better, but somehow I often forget. And she was dealing with Luke's account of this same exact event. A few different nuances, but it's in Luke chapter 22, verses 63 through 71. And she quoted verse 70, where in Luke it says, you know, they all asked the religious leaders, are you then the son of God? And he said to them, it's as you say, you know, yes, I am. And she said, I remember a childhood game I tried to avoid at all costs. It was called King of the Mountain. I remember that one. I bet some of you do too. The players established a high place of some kind as the mountain. The king was the one who could defend his territory by kicking or pushing anyone who came near him. It was a mean game. But it was nothing compared to the real-life King of the Mountain contest that took place between the self-promoting religious leaders, Pilate, Herod, and the true king, Jesus, the one and only. As you picture every moment of this mock court proceeding, don't lose sight of these words. Are you then the Son of God? Imagine every event unfolding on a large TV screen. And during the entire ordeal, these words scroll boldly across the bottom of the scene. The Son of God. 
The irony is this. The only reason Christ was standing in front of them was because he was exactly who they tried him for being. And though his accusers couldn't see the truth for themselves, Christ was found guilty of being the Son of God. And they would end up releasing an insurrectionist and crucifying the Savior of the world. Aren't you thankful that humanity can try Christ for being anything they choose, and yet he is who he is? No amount of disbelief can change him or move him. Why did the chief priests and teachers of the law disbelieve? Why couldn't they accept him as their Messiah? And here it comes. Because they wanted to be king of the mountain. And so our Savior mocked, spat upon, struck again and again, flogged beyond recognition, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the bright and morning star, the Alpha and Omega, the anointed of the Lord, the beloved Son of God, the radiance of his Father's glory, the light of the world, the hope of glory, the lily of the valley, the Prince of Peace, the seed of David, the Son of Righteousness, the blessed and only King, the King of kings and Lord of lords, Emmanuel, the with of God. The most terrifying truth a mocking humanity will ever confront is that no matter how Jesus is belittled, he cannot be made little. He is the king of the mountain. And that's the truth we need to cling to at all times. Lord, we exalt you and we recognize that you are the king. Lord, I know that intellectually, oftentimes we we proclaim and we believe that you are the king. But Lord, I pray that you would move past those kind of head knowledges into our heart, that in our hearts we would believe and live in light of the fact that you are king of the mountain. You rule, you reign, you always have, you always will. And when a, your creatures are struggling or our world seems like it's spinning the wrong way, you haven't lost sight of us. You haven't abdicated your throne. You are working. And I ask that you would give us the eyes and the faith, Lord, to see beyond what this physical realm and to walk by faith knowing that, Lord, only you reign. You are in control and you are good and we can count on you. Lord, I pray that your word would be an encouragement to our hearts today, and we praise you. Amen.
Thank you for being with us this morning. Come join us online for all the different events happening. Come back, be with us on Wednesday as we walk through the Bible together and enjoy great fellowship in his word. God bless.